second reading is taken from Amos chapter 8, verses 4 through 7. Hear this, you who trample on the needy and bring the poor of the land to an end, saying, When will the new moon be over, and that we may sh sh sell grain? And the Sabbath that we may offer wheat for sale, that we may make the upa small and shekel great, and deal deceitfully with false balances. That we may buy the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals and sell the chaff of the wheat. The Lord has sworn by the pride of Jacob, surely I will never forget any of their deeds. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The psalm is taken from 113. Praise the Lord, praise, praise O servants of the Lord, praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the man, Lord, from this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. The Lord is high above all nations, and his glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord, of, Lord our God, who is seated on high? Who looks down from on the heavens and earth? He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. To make, to make them, them sit, sit with, with, princes, prince, with the princes, princes of his people. people. He gives the barren woman a home and making her the joyous mother of, the, of children. Praise the Lord. The epistle is taken from 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 15. First of all, then I urge the supplication, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people for kings and all who are in high positions that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the test testimony given at the proper time. For this, is, for this I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am telling the truth, I am not lying. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. I desire that then that in every place the men should pray, lifting holy hands with ang without anger or quarreling. Likewise, also the women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire but with what is proper for women who profess God, godliness with good works. Let, let a woman learn quiet, quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived by the woman, was, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet she will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. appointed for this morning is according to Luke, the 15th, 16th chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. Jesus also said to the disciples, there was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that this man was wasting his possession. And he called him and said to him, What is this that I hear about you? Turn in the account of your management, for you can no longer be manager. And the manager said to himself, What shall I do, since my master is taking the management away from me? I am not strong enough to dig, and I am ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do, so that when I am removed from management, people may receive me into their houses. So summoning his master's debtors, one by one, 
He said to the first, How much do you owe my master? He said, A hundred measures of oil. He said to him, Take your bill, sit down quickly, and write fifty. Then he said to another, And how much do you owe? He said, A hundred measures of wheat. He said to him, Take your bill and write eighty. The master commanded the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourself by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. One who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much. And one who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust you the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. The Pharisees, who were lovers of money, heard all these things and they ridiculed him. And he said to them, You are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ.
Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Heavenly Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious, gracious God, you have indeed given us manifold blessings, more than we even realize sometimes. Help us not to squander these resources and blessings given to us, but use them as you prompt, use them generously to the glory of your name, to the extension of your kingdom, and just bless us as we delve into the word today. May it make sense through the power of the Spirit, and may we be edified, may we learn, may we put into effect uh, what we hear and learn today. Amen. There is a woman by the name of Osceola McCarty. She was born in 1908, and she died in um, 1999. She was 91 years old when she died. At the age of 12, she had to drop out of school and start attending to a sick aunt. And after the aunt passed away, one thing led to another, and Osceola never got back into school. But she became a professional, if you want to say, professional um, clothes washer for other people, and she ironed their clothes. And she chose not to use modern washing machines, but a scrub board. She lived in a little town called Hattiesburg, Mississippi. She paid her bills on time every month, and some of the bills were uh, her cemetery plot, her life insurance, and she made sure that she tithed every month, and everything else went into the bank. And by the time she was 86 years old, she gave six-tenths of her estate to the Uni University of Southern Mississippi. And that amounted to about $150,000. And at the end of her life, she said this, the Lord portioned out the good things in life to me just fine. Who needs any more? And I think she lived her life according to the philosophy of the Danish theologian and philosopher by the name of Soren Kierkegaard. He said, it's more blessed to give than to receive, but then it's also more blessed to be able to do without than have to have. I think that we see that in this woman's life. I think that Osceola lived a life that was rich and prosperous. And I'm wondering today, are you living a truly rich and prosperous life? We're going to talk today about what it means to live a truly rich and prosperous life. And first of all, as we delve into the lesson from Amos, Amos chapter 8, I gleaned from there then in order to live a truly rich and prosperous life, we need to have a sober understanding of wealth and riches. I think many Americans are addicted to prosperity, to wealth and luxury. Now, before you start making assumptions, I should say that I don't think that God wants us necessarily to be living impoverished. He's given us all things, and it's right and proper to enjoy a measure of prosperity. But having said that, I think a lot of people become addicted to luxury and riches and prosperity. What is the definition of addiction? Addiction is compulsive engagement in rewarding stimuli despite the adverse consequences. So you can be addicted to gambling, you can be addicted to pornography, you can be addicted to drugs or alcohol, and yes, you can become addicted to luxury and wealth and prosperity. 
There was a former hedge fund manager by the name of Sam Polk, and he wrote an article a few years ago. He said one year he made $3.6 million just in bonuses after just one year. And when he received the $3.6 million bonus check, he said he was angry. He said he was angry because, in retrospect, he had become like that drunk who was waiting for just one more drink because he was addicted to alcohol. And he confessed that in his life, he had become addicted to wealth and prosperity. He was only 30 years old. He had no family that he needed to support. He had no philanthropic organizations that he gave to, no philanthropic goals. The main goal in his life was to make as much money as he could. And so when he got the $3.6 million check, he was angry because he felt it wasn't enough. And he went on to say that after his girlfriend left him because of his addiction to money, he went to a counselor, and the counselor told him, maybe you should stop accumulating wealth and start working on the wound that's deep in your soul. So addictions do happen. They happen to the best of us. And according to this counselor, at least, they happen oftentimes because of wounds deep in our soul. And also because of our sinful nature and our fallen state as human beings. So Amos, in Amos chapter 8, is writing a letter to, you might say, roughly speaking, hedge fund managers of his day. These were religious leaders. But the religious leaders of that day in the northern kingdom had all the power and the prosperity. And so if you're reading through Amos, it appears that these rich, prosperous rulers had been become addicted to power and money and prosperity. And in their pursuit of it, they were so addicted that they oppressed the poor and the needy. And as God's spokesman, to these rich and powerful people, Amos said, Surely God will never forget any of your deeds. So, do you think that we have become addicted to luxury and prosperity and riches here in the United States of America? I think we're surrounded by it. Drive down the street and you see some pretty expensive cars sometimes zipping by you. Sometimes in the course of a day, we might drive through a pretty prosperous neighborhood where the houses are very, very expensive. We turn on the TV set. At least a few years ago, we saw a show called The Lifestyle of the Rich and the Famous. So we know what it looks like to be prosperous here in the United States. And if we're not enjoying prosperity ourselves, Oftentimes, people are seeking after it. They've made that their goal. And if you're searching for prosperity and riches rather than seeking God, then you're basically in the same situation as those people that Amos was decrying in the 8th century B.C. And so what I glean from the Old Testament lesson today if we're seeking to have a truly rich and prosperous life, it's not found in riches and prosperity of this world necessarily. In fact, you can become addicted to it. You want more and more of it, just like a drug addict, and it never satisfies. What truly satisfies is the true and living God. And when we pursue him, we become like him. The true and living God is merciful and long-suffering and loving and gracious. 
And as we pursue him, those attributes become ours. But if we pursue the wealth of this world, we become like wealth. It's cold, it's sterile, it's lifeless, and oftentimes um, very cruel. Secondly, if we're wanting to live a truly prosperous and rich life, we need to seek to have the same attitude that God has towards creation and those around us. And as we read through the Old Testament and New Testament, we get a good idea of God's heart towards humanity and th towards his creatures. Remember what it says in John 3.16, God so loved the world. And as we read through the Old Testament, it becomes very apparent to us that God has a heart for the widow, the orphan, the poor, and the needy. And this is what it says in Psalm 113 that we just read responsively. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and with the princes of his people. And what does it say in the epistle lesson for today? That Christ gave himself as a ransom for all. So Jesus Christ is God's prince, and he came to this world to seek and to save that which is lost. And he put down his riches, he put down his wealth and prosperity at the cross. And through his work on the cross, he redeemed us and made us into princes like him. And so to me, that gives us an insight into God's heart. He loves those who are poor. He desires to raise up those who are on the ash heap, who are poor and powerless and oppressed. And so what is the atmosphere in 2016? As we look out upon our land, as we look out upon the world today. Well, here in the United States, we've heard this term used, income inequality, that seems to be rising. As we look out upon the economic situation in our country, we do see the upper class becoming more powerful and more wealthy. We see the middle class seeming to shrink. We see the underclass seeming to become larger. We see many, many people chronically out of work. We know that thousands of people, possibly hundreds of thousands of people, are coming across our border. We know that there are many, many refugees flowing into Europe and into the United States. And I think all of us have opinions as to why this is happening. And sometimes we might differ in our opinions as to what the cause of this is. We might have opinions on how to solve the problem. But I think an important thing which we often forget in our political discourse and in our attitudes is what is God's heart according to the, uh, about these problems that we have. Another problem that we have is homelessness. Um, we just had on the news for week after week the problem with the spring water trail, what's going on with the homeless there. We know that a new homeless shelter was open not too far away from here. Um, we know that in Portland and Clark County, there's a huge homeless problem. Just look under every overpass in our area. Just look downtown. You're going to bump into someone probably, if you spend some time there, uh, any time at all, who's homeless. And in Seattle, they have a huger homeless problem than we do, and just about every major city across our country does. And like I said, we have opinions about 
all of these things. But I guess it really becomes real when we bump into that problem with flesh and blood. Like if we bump into a homeless person on the street or if a homeless person comes to our building here, which they do. And so what must we do as we deal with these problems? I believe that we need to have the heart of God. So rather than simply giving someone a whole cold shoulder, rather than simply having an opinion about someone who finds themselves in this situation, maybe simply a prayer to God, God, what would you have me do in a situation like this? It can soften our hearts and help us to minister as the Holy Spirit would have us minister. So secondarily, I believe, in order to live a prosperous, rich life, one that's truly fulfilling, God wants us to have his heart about these systemic, social, and economic problems that we have around us. And then thirdly, God wants us, according to the gospel lesson today, to use our recess, resources shrewdly for the kingdom. We have in front of us in the gospel lesson a parable. And every time I encounter this parable in the lectionary, I sweat. It's a difficult parable to get your mind around, to understand what the Holy Spirit is trying to say there. It's the parable of the dishonest manager. I remember from seminary, our seminary instructor who was teaching us especially about how to exegete parables. One of the things that he constantly reminded us about, it was almost a mantra to him, it was remember punctum um, dividendum. Punctum dividendum. Latin term meaning the point of comparison. So when we got to parables and we were going off on the wrong track, he would always say punctum dividendum. That would usually get us back on the right track. So when you're looking at a parable, you don't get caught up in all the details. When you're looking at a parable, the details are there to help tell the story. But the point of a parable is the point of a comparison. What is the main issue that the Holy Spirit is confronting us with? And so as I looked, was sweating over this parable in Luke chapter 16 this week. It seems to me, and I did also consult a commentary, and fortunately he agreed with me. That's always good. And basically what it seems to me to be saying is that this dishonest manager was shrewd. That was the main point of the whole thing. He had lost his job because he had mismanaged the finances of his master. His master found out about it. And now quickly, uh, this manager goes around to all of the clients and tries to get some money from them, have them settle up their accounts before he loses his job. And um, he does it in such a way that he befriends himself with these debtors so that when he ultimately loses his job and probably won't have any more income, he's friends with these people and they can help him out um, financially. And even the master of this dishonest manager, after everything is said and done, he compliments the manager on his shrewdness. Not on his dishonesty, but the fact that he quickly and shrewdly found a um, solution to his economic problem. And that's what God wants us to do and be with our resources that he's given to us. He wants us to be shrewd. I think oftentimes we have money, we've got a paycheck, 
And rather than following a budget, rather than being responsible with what we have, it's so easy just to go out and spend it all and not plan, not save, just to squander the resources that God has given to us. Not only our financial resources, but our mental resources and the gifts that God has given to us. But we have a beautiful example in the life of Jesus Christ. He's God's prince. He's God's only son. He is God incarnate. In talking about gifts and abilities, he was endowed to the hilt with them. And what did he do with those gifts and abilities? Did he use them for his own exaltation here on earth? Did he build up his own kingdom here on earth? No, we're reminded in the, gospel, in the epistle lesson today that he laid down his life for us. And it's because of that that heaven is going to be populated. If Jesus had used his resources for himself, selfishly, heaven would be very vacant. But he didn't do that. He used his resources shrewdly, not for himself, but for for the fallen human race, and we are blessed. And in order to live a rich and truly prosperous life, that's what God exhorts us to do. Follow the example of Jesus. I've got pinned up on the bulletin board there a little article. Maybe some of you have seen it. I have a cousin, or had a cousin, by the name of Norman. He was a medical doctor in California. He was single. He died just last year. He died with an estate of over two million dollars. And my other cousin, his nephew, um, was interviewed for this article and he gave almost his entire estate to charity. He was a member of one of our congregations down in Danville, California, gave a generous amount to that congregation. And then the article states that he gave over $200,000 to the Dakota Boys Ranch, which is a ministry of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. And to me, that was a prosperous, rich life, a life well-lived. He could have gone on exotic vacations. I think he probably did go on a few. He could have driven an extravagant car. He did not. He could have lived in a palace. He did not. He was given riches. He was given prosperity and gifts. But to me, he was a good example how to live a rich, a truly rich and prosperous life. As we follow Jesus, as we take up our cross, as we read scripture, as we partake of the sacrament today, may it all come together in a beautiful synergy so that we also live a truly rich and prosperous life. To the glory of God. Amen. And the peace of God that passes all understanding, keep our hearts and our minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. I invite you to rise if you can, and together with all Christians, we confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was and made man, man, and was, and was crucified, crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. 
and I believe, I believe in the Holy, Holy Spirit, Spirit, the Lord, Lord and giver, giver of life, life who proceeds from, from the Father and the Son, who with, with the, the Father, Father and the Son together, together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke, spoke by the prophets, and I believe, I believe in one, one holy, holy Christian and apostolic, apostolic church, I acknowledge, I acknowledge one, one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. I see.